This video is about the Gauss-Markov conditions for simple linear regression. The reason that we care about the Gauss-Markov conditions is because if they hold, then we know that the OLS estimators are the best linear unbiased estimators for the true intercept and the true slope. The Gauss-Markov conditions basically take the three simple linear regression OLS assumptions and they add one more. The one more that they add is that the error terms are homoscedastic. Remember, that means that the error has the same variance independent of the value of your x variable. So the Gauss-Markov conditions say that the expected value of the error term is zero once you condition on the value of x. Next, the variance of the error term is constant. Right? There's that homoscedasticity assumption. And finally, it says that the errors are not correlated for different observations. Now, in order for these Gauss-Markov conditions to hold, we are going to need to know the values of our x variables. Notice, all of them have this conditional probability where the statement is conditional on the x values in our sample. Just a reminder about the OLS assumptions. So the first one is that the conditional distribution of the error term given xi has a mean of zero. The second one is that we have a random sample, and the third one is that large outliers are unlikely. So the first Gauss-Markov condition just says that the expected value of the error term given x is going to equal zero. And that's going to come from the first two OLS assumptions. First of all, OLS number one says the conditional distribution of the error term given x has a mean of zero. Right, now that was actually one observation, ui, and that observation's corresponding x value. The difference here with the Gauss-Markov theorem is that it says the error for any observation given the x values for all of the observations is equal to zero. So that's the difference with the Gauss-Markov assumption. We said the error of observation i is expected to be zero given all of the observations for x. Well, that will work because if the conditional distribution, because if OLS1 holds, so that means that the error for observation i is expected to be zero when you know xi. Well, if xi is independent of all of the other xi's, then it doesn't matter what the values of those other xi's are, it will not affect the error for observation i. Now, the third OLS assumption will lead us to the second Gauss-Markov condition. The third OLS assumption is that large outliers are unlikely. The second Gauss-Markov condition is basically saying that the variance of the error term is equal to sigma squared u. This is saying that it has a constant variance. And remember, that's this idea of homoscedasticity. So it doesn't matter what the values of all the x variables are. We are going to have the same variance for the error term. So if we have heteroscedasticity, then this assumption fails. And then we have this other part where the variance of the error term is between zero and infinity. Okay, so it's not a constant, and it's not something with an infinite variance. Now, if you look in the book for the third OLS assumption, it gives you this equation that the expected value of your variable to the fourth power is between zero and infinity. And that's true for x and y. And to translate that into English, it basically means that we do not have fat tails in our distribution. So if we have, you're used to seeing something like a normal distribution, something with fat tails would have more probability in the tail area. It wouldn't have as high of a probability in the middle. So the probability that you find something farther away from the mean is higher. And it's okay to have a little bit of a fat tail, but if you had really fat tails, that would mean that large outliers are very likely. So this is just saying that large outliers are not very likely. And that's good because linear regression is sensitive to outliers. So if your data have outliers, then linear regression is not a great tool to analyze those data. All right, on to the last Gauss-Markov condition. This one says that the error terms are uncorrelated for different observations. And I want to get into this notation here where we have 
the error UI times UJ. If we were to take the expected value of that product, if the error terms were positively correlated, we would expect to get a number that's positive. If they were negatively correlated, we get a number that is negative. If they're unrelated, we would get zero. And this I not equal to J just says that we are not looking at the same error term. We want to take the error for observation I and compare it to any of the other observations error terms. So the logic here is that we can simplify the Gauss-Markov expression GM3 into something a little more manageable. So because Xi and Yi are randomly sampled, then that means that the values of, say, x1 and xn or any other x value that is not observation i or observation j will not have an effect on the errors for observation i or observation j. Also, remember, with statistical independence, we could multiply these expected values out. So if we want to break apart what we had just seen, Markov condition, we could break it apart into the expected value of the error for observation i given the x value for observation i, and then multiply that times the expected value of the error term for observation j given the x value for observation j. And again, i and j have to be different. But both of those things are going to equal zero, so you have zero times zero gives you zero. Now, Here's my note on notation here. Xi, in this case, is supposed to be like a general term for any observation of x. And Xj is a different observation. So you're just multiplying the expected value of those different error terms. So when we have this phrase that the expected value of the error term for observation i given the x value for observation i is equal to zero for all i, well, j is some other observation. So if you just replace that subscript with J, that means it's a different observation that's not I. And I think this is where students get really confused. They're like, wait, I thought it was an I and now it's a J. And I think it's useful to translate this stuff into English before you try to really like get lost in the math. The math can look confusing, but what I want you to think about is what are the ideas behind that math? So now let's get back to the third Gauss-Markov condition. If we know that the expected value of the error term for any observation given its x value is zero, then we're going to have the third Gauss-Markov condition hold. So basically, if OLS assumptions are true and we also have homoscedasticity, that means that we have the Gauss-Markov conditions. So what if the Gauss-Markov conditions are not satisfied? So if we cannot also get that additional homoscedasticity assumption, then there's a different technique to estimate the slope and intercept. It's called weighted least squares. It's more efficient, but we will not be working with it in this class. I basically just want you to know that if we have heteroscedasticity, maybe weighted least squares will give us better results. Also, what if we have a lot of outliers? If that's the case, there's another technique called least absolute deviations, and it's not so sensitive to outliers. Least absolute deviations tries to minimize. Here, we still have yi minus y hat i, basically the actual value of y minus the predicted value. With OLS, we would square this number before we add it up. Least absolute deviations does not square that number. Okay. There is the crash course in Gauss-Markov conditions.